Hi guys, I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. Welcome to the Goop Podcast, made possible by our friends at Bolin Branch. One Thursday of every month, I'll be interviewing a culture changer. And every Thursday in between, editors from our content team will be sitting down with a spate of proactive thinkers and industry disruptors. Today's guest is Adam Grant, Wharton's top-rated professor and the New York Times bestselling author of Originals, Give and Take, and Option B, which he co-wrote with Sheryl Sandberg. Adam is a leading expert on motivation and creativity, particularly as it applies to the workplace and management. You should start assuming that the other side actually is uh, not there to change your mind, but rather there to learn from you. And so think about, okay, you know, what, what can I teach this person that they don't know? Which is a very different, <laughs> different mindset from saying, uh, yeah, let me, let me tell you why you're an idiot. Adam earned his PhD in organizational psychology from the University of Michigan and his BA from Harvard University. Previously, he was a record-setting advertising director, a junior Olympic springboard diver, and a professional magician. Elise Lunin, the chief content officer here at Goop, got Adam to tell her about the most important things he's learned from studying a lot of different kinds of office culture, from how to have healthy confrontations with coworkers to the latest research on diversity at work, and also how to foster creativity in the next generation. Before we get to their conversation, let's talk about one of our partners. Hey, it's Elise. A few years ago, we did a story on Goop about organic cotton. In the course of our deep dive, we learned how toxic conventional cotton can really be for the environment and then for our bodies, and just how hard it is to find GOT certified organic cotton, the highest certification in organic cotton farming and production. Not only is Boland Branch's bedding GOT certified, but it's fair trade certified too. This means that everyone involved in the supply chain, from their farmers to the factory workers, has been treated fairly. Another reason to love Bull and Branch, the sheets are incredibly soft and only get softer the longer you have them. For $50 off your first set, head over to bullandbranch.com and use promo code GOOP. After the conversation, I'll be doing a quick round of Ask Me Anything. If you've got a burning or totally random question you want me to answer, hit us up at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. Now, let's get to Elise's interview with Adam Grant. I'm a huge fan of Originals. I blew through it when it came out a few years ago. Oh, thank you for reading. Of course. It was a great read. And one of the things that I love most about it was that it sort of turns everything that you expect on its head. So the whole idea that child prodigies rarely go on to become... Um, adult prodigies, I guess, that you can't really foster creativity, that you can only thwart it in your children. Those were all sort of these eye-opening moments for me. So I'd love to sort of start there. What are the habits and practices of original thinkers? Yeah. So I I always looked at, you know, the great innovators in the world and thought I can never be one of those people because they're willing to take crazy risks and, you know, they act way in advance and they have a ton of confidence. And I found out that none of those things were true. So highly original thinkers hate taking risks, maybe even more than the rest of us. I always think of Bill Gates, right? We, we tell the story all the time about, oh, you know, he drops out of college and goes for broke and starts Microsoft. The real story of Bill Gates, though, is that he takes a leave of absence from college, bankrolled by his parents, and he already has a year of software sales under his belt. Doesn't sound like risk taking, does it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think when, when you look at cases like that, what a lot of the evidence suggests is that. You know, people who are who are great at having creative ideas and acting on them, they hate failing, right? They they want to make sure that they're successful, but they know they need to take a risk every once in a while. So they kind of manage risk like a stock portfolio. And they say, look, if I'm going to do something crazy in one realm of my life, then I'm going to be really safe and have a bunch of boring mutual funds just in case. Right. In terms of looking at creatives, how much of that is sort of who we are as people and sort of what we're here to do and how much of that is influenced by how we're raised or society or the role that we play? Well, I think, I mean, the, the evidence is pretty clear that there are some people who are just born with a slight edge, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's easier to be creative if you're naturally rebellious and nonconforming. And if, you know, you're constantly asking questions and you're the kind of student who annoyed your teachers in school because you were always saying, wait, that's not right. Or wait, can you tell me more about this? And your teachers were like, shut up already. But I think that the good news is that kids are inherently creative, right? If you if you talk to a five or a six-year-old, they have all sorts of interesting, unusual questions. And I think we either beat that out of them or they end up unlearning it at some point. 
when they realize that the way you succeed in, at least in Western society, is you follow the rules, mm -hmm. right? You try to get good grades, you respect your, your elders, you go out of your way to, to fit in as opposed to stand out. And that's a great way to forget how to think differently. Mm. Yeah, I think it's that's so inbred, so difficult, particularly because you know, so many of us are driven by performance. So what do, what's the antidote? Is it just different type of schooling? Like, how do you, how do we change culture? <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just a psychologist, right? <laughs> I study this stuff, but I'll tell you what, one of the most interesting things that I've learned in the past year is if you look at highly creative adults, they were more likely to grow up in families where their, their parents argued a lot. Mm. This is not parents who are physically violent or anything. Uh, they weren't shouting either but they had more regular debates. Mm -hmm. And I think a few things happen when, when you argue in front of your kids, which most parents are afraid to do, right? Because we, we don't want them to worry about getting divorced and you know we want to pre present a united front. But if you never argue in front of their, your kids, they never learn to think for themselves. They always follow what their parents ask them to do. Whereas if they see you disagree, they actually have to say, well, what do I think? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that, that a, lot of, you know, a lot of creativity comes from debate. From saying, you know, here's an idea or an insight. Wait, I disagree with that. And then trying to work out your differences and coming to a better solution. And if you look at what happens to kids whose parents argue a lot, it's not how frequently you fight that matters for, you know, affecting their well-being. It's how, how respectfully and constructively you fight. And so by modeling respectful debate, parents can actually teach kids not only to be happier and, uh, and a little bit more friendly and helpful in school, but also to think more creatively. That's so interesting. And there's so much to unpack there. But, you know, just to start with this idea of sort of healthy confrontation, right? And doing it in a way that everyone feels heard and, and everyone says what's on their mind. And I, you know, I think kids are so intuitive and so emotional. And I think when you're sublimating how you feel and you're, you're failing to express it or refusing to express it, like they can feel it. And I would imagine that beyond being creative, which I know we we all sort of want to be in our lives to some extent, it probably this helps kids be more successful, I would imagine, once they have to actually interact in the real world. Yeah, I think it's huge because it, it's not actually that productive in life to just run away from every argument or conflict that, that you come across, right? So if, you know, I, my wife and I have talked about this with our kids and, you know, it's something I, I end up thinking about a lot. You actually want to you want to model what a good conflict looks like. <laughs> And so we can think about what are those rules? Well, well, one rule is that you're supposed to argue like you're right, but listen like you're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way, you know, you get some, some real confrontation, but you also hope that both sides walk away learning from it. Mm -hmm. Another rule that I really like is to say that you should start assuming that the other side actually is uh, not there to change your mind, but rather there to learn from you. And so think about, okay, you know, what, what could I teach this person that they don't know? Which is a very different, a different mindset from saying, uh, yeah, let me, let me tell you why you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's interesting. We practice something at Goop or we try to practice. Um, it's based on this 90-page book called The Collaborative Way. It's based on these five tenets and we've added to them. But two of them are sort of the most important and we try to do it. And one is speak straight and one is listening generously. And what it allows you to do, particularly when you need to have a confrontation at work or have a, a hard conversation, is you say, I'm, I need to speak straight to you. And it's a signal to the other person that they need to listen generously. And speaking straight is essentially what it sounds like. And listening generously is listening with a willingness to have your mind changed. And so you sort of move from a place of defensiveness to openness, which I know is a huge part of work life and how they openly criticize each other, but it feels like a, a path to productive conversation. That's so interesting. Do you ever find that people use speaking straight as cover just to be jerks? No. You know, say, I need to speak straight. I think you are just a horrible human being. Well, that goes against some of the other tenets. So, so one is honoring your commitments. One is being for each other, which is actually very difficult because it's like when, when you think someone's going to fail to show up for your scheduled one-on-ones or they're always going to come prepared, unprepared, sorry, instead of letting it happen, it's your responsibility to help them be more successful. So that doesn't really happen. I also think because it's primarily women who tend to shy away from conflict that we tend to be more res probably almost too respectful but we don't see that. You're not allowed to, like, be abusive. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, it's a tightrope walk, right, between mm -hmm. getting people to be candid with each other and, you know, and tell each other the truth and not sort of being rude or disrespectful. 
Well, and the truth is so subjective, right? And and I think it's when you're working in an organization, it's so hard to even get that 360 perspective on how others perceive you. And I know that's something that you touch on in work life. How can you get a better understanding of how you sit in the world? Well, this is, uh, I've, I've watched Sheryl Sandberg do this so effectively at Facebook. So I've, uh, I've worked with Cheryl for the past few years. And one of the things that always amazes me in a meeting is she's noticed that as she's gotten more powerful, it's harder and harder for people to give her negative feedback, Mm -hmm. right? When she was junior in her career, people would say things like, you know, you, you talk too much in meetings. You really need to, you know, stop dominating the conversation. And I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of people who just spit that out at Cheryl these days. And so she's, she's decided that she needs to make it really safe for people to, to criticize her and help her improve. So what she'll do at the start of a meeting is she'll say, I am working on trying to make sure that I don't dominate this meeting. And in fact, in my whole career, I've never been told that I talk too little. And so I really need to work hard you know, to, to correct enough. Because by default, we all undercorrect. Mm. And I, I think a few things happen when you criticize yourself out loud. One is that the people become less afraid of pointing out those very issues because they know they're, they're not going to be, you know, sort of catching you off guard uh, or, you know, sort of backstabbing you. Uh, they know you're already aware of them mm-hmm. and you're working on them, right? You've, you've basically said, I want that feedback. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, you, you also send a signal to them that uh, there are things that you're not working on or not aware of that maybe you should be, right? So, you know, if there's something else that, that Cheryl wants to improve on but doesn't know she needs to improve on, uh, it's kind of clear there might be a blind spot there. And so people are more likely to come up to her afterward and said, I know you were really focused on, you know, not talking too much in this meeting. But here's another thing that I noticed that I thought you wanted, maybe you'd want to be aware of. Mm-hmm. And I, I think this is such a powerful idea, right, to give ourselves feedback out loud first to make it easier for other people to give us feedback. Mm-hmm. How do you how can people sort of not be triggered by that or not rush to the, but that's not true. Like, that's not how I am. Like, how do you move people into a way of being receptive? If I'm giving feedback? Yeah. So there are a few things you can do. One of my favorite experiments uh, showed that you can get people to be about 40% more receptive to negative feedback just by saying roughly 19 words beforehand. (laughs) Uh, And I may not get the count exactly right, but the gist of it is I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations of you and I'm confident you can reach them. All of a sudden, the conversation changes, right? I'm not here to attack you. I'm actually here to help you. And people end up receiving the feedback in that context much more like they would from a sports coach. Yeah, I've, I've never seen an athlete at any point say, you know, I, I'm going to get really defensive when my coach is telling me I'm doing something wrong, right? You know your coach is seeing things that you can't see and trying to help you get better. And so you, you try to take that into account. Mm-hmm. And I think we want more feedback conversations to go like that at work and at home. Mm-hmm. The other thing that, that I think is, is useful to know is uh, I think that, that so often feedback blindsides people because it feels like a, a one-way conversation. And it should actually be a two-way dialogue. So one of the most useful things you can do when you're giving feedback is to say, you know, I noticed a few things and I wondered if you wanted any feedback. I have never in my life heard somebody say no to that question, right? Because all of a sudden somebody knows something about you that you don't. And the only thing worse than hearing something negative about yourself is knowing that people are having negative thoughts about you, but they're not voicing them. Right. Or they're voicing them to other people. But not to you, right? <laughs> and, then, and then it's all being said behind your back. And right. so, you know, just giving the other person a chance to opt in is helpful. And then you can also say to them, you know, and I'd love your feedback too, so we can figure out how to work more effectively together. And then it really becomes a two-way street. You're off a pedestal. Mm -hmm. And then how do you, do you have tips on how to diffuse? I would imagine that those conversations are difficult always. How do you diffuse that? Like, how do you then ease back into healthy and and friendly work relationships? Uh, I don't know that you always do, but... I think in a lot of cases, it, it comes from making a concerted effort to show that you've heard their feedback. And if you show a willingness to change, right, you're sort of setting a tone for the relationship and saying, look, even if this was hard for you to say to me, you know, I, I really valued it and I'm going to respond to it. I think that one of the, the most straightforward ways to get there is follow up about a week or two after that feedback conversation. Let them know what you took away from it. And say, you know, here's here's how I benefited from this, or here's how I'm trying to put your ideas into action, and it leaves people with the the, the great thing about this is uh, there's sort of a there's a primacy and recency effect that we see in, in a lot of conversations where people are more sensitive to what happens early and late, mm-hmm. and they tend to gloss over more of the middle of an interaction, and so if you can end it on a high note by saying, look, you know, after this, 
uh, it really helped me and here's how, then you sort of get to edit what the whole interaction felt like. Mm -hmm. One thing that's come up a lot or in both episodes of the Work Life podcast that I've been able to listen to so far is this idea of creating safe places where you can create a safe place for criticism, you can create a safe place for comedy where people feel comfortable or confident enough to express themselves. Like what, what goes into that soup? It was actually really surprising to contrast these, these two workplaces that I went into. So, you know, Bridgewater has this culture of radical transparency. One of their principles is that no one has the right to hold a critical opinion without speaking up about it. Which is incredible. Yeah, it's the opposite of pretty much every other workplace I've been to, where if you have a critical opinion, you better not speak up about it. And, you know, they, they tend to be pretty direct and blunt with each other. They don't want to waste time. You know, they build a culture where it is safe to, to criticize just about anybody for anything. Although your criticism has to be relevant. So when I first went in there, I, uh, I said, all right, like, I want to push the boundaries of this and really understand what your culture of, you know, of, of criticizing and challenging is about. And so I went to the, one of the employees and I said, uh, you know, your jeans look stupid, which is not something I would normally say in everyday life, uh, especially as someone, my wife threw out my entire wardrobe after we got married. Uh, this is not something I would normally criticize, but I wanted, to, I wanted to test the culture a little bit and see how do they react to irrelevant criticism. And they actually criticized my criticism. And they said, well, why do you care what, what my jeans look like? Am I doing a good job? That's not a relevant criticism. Uh, and I thought that was so fun because it, it, it pushed me a little bit to think about, okay, if I'm going to challenge these people, it really has to be relevant to our goal or our mission. Right. At The Daily Show, uh, I went in the writer's room. And, you know, I think I've, I've always intuitively believed that in order for, for people to be comfortable trying jokes that might fall flat, they have to feel like nothing bad will, will happen to them if, you know, if, if they make a joke that flops. And it wasn't quite like that. So, you know, they make fun of each other constantly for bad jokes. And the, the head writer, Jubin, actually uh, has been making fun of himself for years uh, for a joke that just completely bombed. And he brings it up every once in a while to say, look, you have to throw a lot of ideas against the wall in order to have a few that stick. What they did do, though, um, Trevor Noah is particularly good at this, is they would call out moments of really great jokes. So that instead of saying, look, you know, we're, we're never going to make fun of you if you say something that's ridiculous, they say, yeah, we will make fun of you because that's part of our comedic mm -hmm. spirit. But when you make a really good joke, we're going to notice it and we're going to value it so that the risk is worth, it's, it's worth taking, right? Because there's a potential reward there. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between psychological safety, which is, you know, feeling like I won't be punished if I make a mistake, and actually feeling valued, where you say, if I throw out a really great insider idea, other people will, you know, will appreciate that and they'll remember it and notice it. And I think we need both of those mm -hmm. things. I think, too, um, you know, people, a comic's going to know a good joke, right? And so I think when you don't allow criticism, it's, it's what's happening with our kids, right? And this consistent praise, like they're smarter than that. And they know that that kid wasn't as fast as that kid. So why are both kids getting, getting a, a yeah, yeah. Why are they both getting a trophy? I think it just without, without quality or acknowledging it or being honest, like nothing has value. So yeah, I, you're right. You do. Uh, if, if, if you're basically rewarding people all the time, then they don't value it. Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean anything if they get re rewarded regardless of what they do. The whole point of a reward is that it's supposed to reinforce an effective behavior. Right. And so you want to give it when something effective happens. That being said, I think when, uh, when a behavior is new and either unpleasant or uncertain, it can be important just to provide it regardless of how well you do it. For example, if you want kids to eat vegetables, one of the best things you can do is reward them for doing that with a treat. <laughs> uh, and then they have a motivation to try it. And then, you know, you can get them to go through a little Pavlovian conditioning and start to say, huh, every time I eat broccoli... I get something really sweet for dessert afterward. Maybe broccoli is, is not that bad. Are your kids good eaters? No. <laughs> not at all. How much of this do you apply to your own life? You know, I've always wanted to be one of those psychologists who doesn't screw up our kids. Uh, but, you know, there, there actually are things that I've learned that are, that are helpful. So uh, one thing a lot of parents are trying to do is raise resilient kids, you know, who have the strength to, you know, to face adversity and, and weather the storms that we all go through in life. And one of the big drivers of, of kids' resilience is this belief called mattering, which is the sense that, you know, if I'm a kid, other people, they notice me, they care about me, and they rely on me, right? I count. I make a difference to them. And I think most parents are pretty good at the first two. You know, as long as we're not, 
getting sucked away by our, our cell phones, uh, we're, we're good at noticing them and paying attention to them. I think the caring about them, yeah, I think this is like every parent's first goal, right, is to show their kids unconditional love. But the third part of knowing you matter is that you feel other people rely on you. And we screw this up royally as parents, right, sort of swooping in to save the day and shield our kids from whatever hardship they might face. They don't actually learn to feel that other people can count on them. And so I started thinking about this, and my wife and I were talking about it, and we realized that one of the ways that we can help you know, our kids feel that we rely on them is to ask them for advice. So I had a, I had a big speech to give. It was, uh, it was my first TED Talk, actually. And you know, I'm going on this, this stage where I know I have only 15 minutes, and you know, I'm looking in the audience, and, and Larry Page is there, and I accidentally trip over Cher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, where am I? What, how, these people are all going to listen to me speak? And I was, I was super nervous, and I also knew there was going to be a video out there afterward. And so I, I went to uh, our oldest daughter, who was seven at the time, and I said, I'm, I have this big speech to give on a, you know, on a, a large stage, and you know, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm worrying about it. What should I do? And she started giving me some great tips. <laughs> she said, you know, you should, you should think about the worst thing that could happen, and then, you know, you'll realize that probably won't happen. She said, uh, you should practice a lot and really rehearse it so you feel extra comfortable. And my hope in the moment was that I was showing her that, you know, that I valued her advice. And, you know, she's somebody that can be relied on. Well, a few weeks later, she has to give a little presentation in school. And she's going to go on stage, and she's t she tells me that she's nervous. And I, instead of telling her what to do, I can go back and say, well, what, what advice did you give me a few weeks ago? And then she learns that she can rely on herself, that I trusted her advice, and that she has the strength to face a, a tough situation like this. And I think this is something that every parent could do, right? Don't, don't pick a, a situation that's going to freak your child out, but pick a, you know, a reasonable challenge that you might face in everyday life. Ask for advice about it, and you're also normalizing struggle then mm -hmm. to say, look, it's, you know, it's, it's perfectly acceptable and common for an adult to you know, stumble every once in a while. And you know, the, the key to dealing with that is, you know, is, is to pick yourself back up again. We'll have more of Elise's conversation with Adam Grant in a minute. In the meantime, let's talk about one of our partners. We've written a lot on Goop about the importance of sleep. It's when our bodies unpack and recover from the stresses of the day and not getting enough of it can be detrimental to our health. An essential part of any clean sleep routine is perfectly crisp yet soft bedding. I think we're all on the same page on this one. At Goop, we focus on GOTS certified organic cotton sheeting, which means that no harmful chemicals were used in their creation, which is definitely better for the environment and also for our bodies. A company that's setting the gold standard in the industry is Bowl & Branch. They use 100% pure organic cotton and everything is ethically made, meaning that every farmer and factory worker is treated fairly every step of the way. If this all weren't enough, the sheets are incredibly soft and only get cozier the more you wash them. They are a staple at Goop headquarters and I have them for my baby's crib, for my bed, and for the bed of my five-year-old. So now it's your turn. Bowl & Branch has a little clean sleep challenge for you. Take 30 days to sleep on their incredibly soft organic cotton bedding or return it for a full refund, no questions asked. Head over to bowlandbranch.com and use promo code GOOP for $50 off your first set of sheets. Let's get back to our chat with Adam Grant. You've worked with a lot of businesses. You've seen a lot of, of offices. So what, what are the components of a phenomenal workplace? What's dream state? Ooh, well, I think the, the place I have to start is to say you want a culture of givers rather than takers, mm -hmm. where you look at your colleagues and instead of being afraid that you're out, they're out to get you, you actually feel like they're out to help you. And I think that, you know, one of, one of the key markers of a great team is where people care about each other's success as much as they do their own. And there, I, there, there's a lot we could talk about about how to get there, but that, that's probably the first thing that I look for. Because if you have a, a culture where everybody is out for themselves, then you end up becoming less than the sum of, their, of your parts. And you end up also having a, you know, a, a workplace that people are not excited to go, mm -hmm. where they don't feel like they have trust and strong relationships and 
you know, a, a chance to contribute in ways that are meaningful and, and make them feel like their their work matters. It's like the givers, matchers, takers, right? Like that's... Nicely done. Yeah. So Goop is primarily women and, and men who love them. But so we're, I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very female and which I think works because we're all, for the most part, givers. But how do you... What's your advice to women who might not be in female heavy work environments in terms of not being the person who's always giving. Yeah. So this is, you know, I'm going to tell you a bunch of things that I wish were not true, but they're not going to surprise you at all. Uh, The first thing is I I really hadn't thought to analyze my data by gender differences until uh, I sat down with Cheryl Sandberg. Uh, My first book came out about a month after Lean In and we ended up on a uh, speaking at an event sort of back to back and uh, ended up uh, getting to know her, and she started grilling me on, on gender differences in my data. And she remembers it as, as inquiring. I remember it as grilling. And you know, the, the, question, the, the question was, well, you know, what, what are the consequences of, you know, of being helpful and generous for women versus men? And so I had a long flight back from California to the East Coast. I reanalyzed a decade of my own research, and I was horrified by what I found. Uh, first of all, uh, women were were doing much more of the giving that's that's most valuable but least visible. So they were doing the one on one mentoring behind the scenes, the problem solving and the helping. And meanwhile, men were more likely to show up in ways that were highly visible but not that important, like you know arriving early for a meeting and then uh, arranging all two hundred chairs where everyone would see that they were setting up, uh, which was this sort of weird hero macho thing that uh, that just didn't really help anybody. <laughs> Uh, or they would respond to an email list to try to show off that they had a lot of expertise where, you know, a, a big chunk of the company was on the list. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't that useful information. And so that that was sad, right? Women got stuck with a lot of office housework, the taking notes in meetings, the, you know, planning parties and organizing events, uh, which is not that strategic. And, you know, although it, you know, somebody needs to do it, it's not the kind of giving behavior that, that normally gets gets appreciated and recognized. And so that was bad news. And then I looked at the consequences of giving, and it was very clear that a woman had to spend about a quarter to a fifth of her week helping uh, just to get the same performance reviews as a man who is equally effective at his job but did very little whatsoever for colleagues and clients above and beyond the job description. And uh, men who who spent a lot of time helping were celebrated for it. And I think some of this runs through gender stereotypes, right? So what do you do when a man is generous? Uh, what a lot of people do is, I'm going to caricature this, but it looks something like this. Huh. I never would have sp- expected a man to care about another human. I must now shower him with praise and rewards. Whereas when a woman helped, it's like, well, she's caring and communal. She's supposed to be. She wants to help. And so I take it for granted. And then when women didn't help, they were more likely then to get punished for it, for violating that, that gender stereotype. Whereas when men didn't help, people are like, yeah, you're supposed to be, you know, ambitious and results focused. It's all good. And I think it's a travesty that in the 21st century, we are still evaluating people on their gender as opposed to their contribution. But we are a very, very long way from mm-hmm. from justice and equality on this. Yeah, no, it feels interminable. And it's and it's and it's super insidious. I was saying to my husband, which I think finally resonated with him. We both work. We have two young kids. And, you know, I still do a majority of work at home. He's an incredible dad, um, but I do most of the drop-offs and and not, I can't pick them up because I'm at work. And I was saying to him, I was like, you don't understand. People at school see you and they're like, you are an amazing, engaged dad. And they see me and sometimes our nanny's dropping off the kids. It's not always me. And I'm behind the starting block. Like you are 200 yards in front of me for doing less work, you know? It's totally unfair. It's, it, yeah, but I think until we even unpack it for ourselves and understand how we have allowed it to happen in our own relationships as well, like it won't change. I 100% agree. And, you know, I, obviously, as an organizational psychologist, I don't have a whole lot of insight on how to change this dynamic at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think there are steps we can take in the workplace that, that do make a difference. And I'm very wary of mansplaining here. But. <laughs> I'm, ne- I'm, I'm ne- not setting you up, I promise. I've never been a woman. <laughs> I don't know what the lived experience is like, obviously, but uh, I have spent a lot of years, you know, gathering evidence and, and trying to understand what, you know, what moves the needle. And I think there are a few things to do individually and organizationally. So the, the first thing that, that really seems to have an impact is 
uh, women, it turns out, it's totally fine for them to say no if they're thoughtful about how they say it. So women get penalized more when they say no for reasons that are perceived as selfish. Um, but a no doesn't feel like a no if it's a no because of the work that you're doing for other people. Uh, so researchers call this a relational account. Mm. And it's basically saying, look, I can't do this thing you're asking me to do because I'm too busy helping other people. And then you maintain that image of being caring and giving. And so one of the things that I've actually watched some of my, my female former students do is, you know, they've been asked to get involved in, uh, you know, something like um, a common example would be, oh, well, we need we need a woman to go to our recruiting event. Uh, to, you know, to try to get to attract new hires, we need to show that we're gender diverse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, women get stuck with way more of those commitments, too. And instead of saying, no, I'm too busy, uh, what you do is you say, okay, uh, you know, I'd really love to help with this. Here are the four other things I'm helping with right now. And, you know, if, if there's a way to take one of those off my plate, I'd happily substitute this in. And often people are stunned by how many different, you know, commitments they already have. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times, you know, no one else has that, visi that visibility into your work life. And so that, I think that, that would be one thing that's, that's probably worth thinking about a little bit. Remembering that every no is a chance to say yes to when it matters more. Um, and a no in the context of I can't do this because I'm already committed to being really helpful is it doesn't feel like a no at mm -hmm. some level. Yeah, that's interesting and a total bummer that we even have to be so thoughtful. <laughs> it is. And hopefully it's short-lived. Thinking about what you said about sending women to recruit and sending women to hire and this idea of like presenting a, a gender diverse workforce and having people of all color and, and race and ethnicity, how does that become less of a muscle that needs to be exercised for companies? Like when, when do you think, how do companies get to a point of like real representation without making it so tokenism based? I, I don't think you're ever done. Yeah. Right. I think that there are always groups that are going to be neglected or marginalized and, you know, not just because of sexism or racism, but also because people are just a little more comfortable with, you know, with with those who are similar to them. So if uh, Marilyn Brewer actually has some some really interesting research on this, which she shows is that um, most prejudice is driven not by outgroup hate, but by in-group love, uh, you know, a slight preference for people who are similar to you uh, can lead to a lot of discrimination. Uh, there's a, actually a classic uh, Thomas Schelling analysis of neighborhoods where he showed that if even a third of people preferred to have a neighbor of the same race, you end up with a totally segregated neighborhood. Wow. Uh, and again, it's, you know, nothing against the out group, right? But yeah, more, more comfortable with my own kind is sort right. of the mentality. And I think because of that, we always have to, you know, fight a slight uphill battle. I think that when you look at, uh, when you look at the evidence on this, I think we really need um, white men to step up. And I think part of the reason for that is uh, the research says that when women and minorities advocate for diversity, uh, they take a little bit of hit for it. It looks self-serving. It seems like they're trying to advantage their own group uh, or, you know, that they, you know, they're, they're complaining or whining in some way. Whereas when white men stand up and advocate for diversity, they actually get a little bonus for it. And people are like, oh, he's such a good guy. He cares, which is yet another layer of injustice. <laughs> yeah. But. But there is a there's an element of white male privilege there where knowing that you are not sticking your neck out with the same level of risk and people might actually give you a pat in the back for it makes it a lot, a lot easier for the men. I think there are a lot of men. There's some research on this that's just come out showing that a lot of men stay silent because they think it's not their place. Mm -hmm. They think, you know, it's a women's issue and they don't they don't know that, it, you know, they actually have in some ways more standing to be able to speak up. And so, you know, I think I think we need more men advocating for for gender diversity, not just because, you know, it's it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the smart thing to do. We have a ton of evidence on you know the benefits for creativity, the impact on culture as well. If, if you want to you know stop sexual harassment, probably the most reliable change you can make is to get more women in power. Sexual harassment flourishes, the data show in organizations that are dominated by men. And, you know, I think you can look at, at race through a similar lens. And that's, I guess, where I would start. Yeah. I love that idea, too, though, of, of like using what inherently happens. So you start seeding your company with women. You start seeding your company with women of color. Maybe they're inclined to hire more women. Um, and you maybe start to shift the the culture. We have to be mindful of hiring men, which is here. Good, you do at Goop. Yeah, it's a good it's a good place to be. I think I would like to see more organizations have that problem. I know. Thanks so much for joining our talk with Adam Grant. 
You can find more of his work at adamgrant.net. His monthly newsletter is always full of compelling reads to and worth subscribing to, along with his podcast, Work Life. Now it's time for this week's Ask Me Anything. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Asks Irene. Irene, I am not patient. And it's really something that I need to improve. And I'm aware of it. I would be a very patient, zen-like figure if I could change one thing about myself. Have a question? Drop us a line at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for this week's episode of the Goop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share with your friends. To keep up with new episode drops, just hit subscribe. See you next week.